Good evening and welcome back to evening worship. Let's stand and let's be called to worship from Revelation chapter 5. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Our God and our Father, how kind of you to bring us back together tonight for this day of worship and rest, this day of gladness. And so fill our hearts. Would we believe that every word of the, the good news is true? Would we drink deeply of all that you will give us tonight, the feast that is this worship service? We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing and sing the song of grace.
Creed Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father, our hearts are full, and so we feel like everything about this service is land. Yeah, it's extra. We've already known you. We've already worshipped you. We've already been loved and comforted by you. The gospel's already been applied to our souls like balm. We've known rest. We've, we've had a foretaste. You've let us peer over the precipice to, to get just a, the smallest glimpse of the heaven that awaits us. And it left us wanting more, so we came back. 
We knew there was more where that came from. And so here we are. Show us your glory. We know we're hidden in the cleft of the rock in Christ, and so pass on by and let us see you in your glory tonight. Let us know you more. For the more you reveal yourself to us, the more we'll know you're worthy to be worshipped. The more we'll understand what it means to live a life of total praise to you. For every time we learn more of your character, we say still the half hasn't been told us. Behind every corner we stop and stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. It's all true, Lord. Everything the scriptures say about you is true. Everything that creation testifies to and cries out is true. You are one true and living God. And you love your people so well. We have been quieted by your love. We have felt you rejoicing over us with loud singing today. Could you stop time, sir, in this hour? Really, could you come quickly? (laughs) But if not, could you stop time? We have found a settled rest in your presence today, and we don't wish to go anywhere else. Forgive us for not always coming to you with that mindset. Forgive us for not always approaching your throne that way. The fault is all ours. The sin is all ours. And so we're thankful that you forgive sinners. We're thankful that you hear the prayers of your people, that you answer them according to your wisdom. We're thankful that when the answer is not what we want, you are still with us to console us and to remind us yet again of your faithfulness to us. Father, my heart is, and our hearts have been so heavy as we think about Charlotte, as we think about them now traveling. Father, we're just foolish enough that we're going to pray you heal her. And so hear the cries of your people. We're grabbing hold of the throne room of grace and we're saying heal her. In Jesus' name, heal her. And help us to, to bear with with all of the tailors during this time? Would they know a love from you, but would also we be used to remind them of your love? Father, countries are, countries are dropping missiles on other countries, genocides taking place in several places in the world. It's, it's all such a huge mess. Our people pervert justice as fast as they possibly can and in as drastic ways as possible. Would we remember, though, that the nations do, in fact, rage in vain? There's only one king and one throne occupied by you. So would we live in that power and strength? Would we live in that certain future? Would it free us up to be your people, to be busy doing your kingdom work? Our hearts rejoice for all that you are and for all that you've given us. Our hearts rejoice that... You've given us our daily bread that you've not led us into temptation, but for your name's sake, you work mightily through us. We have seen your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray your kingdom come and start below as it is in heaven. And would you be so kind as to even use us? Use our prayers. Use our singing, especially as we sing your inspired word here in just a minute. Use the word preached and read. Use the conversations after the benediction. Father, use this day to put us back in the pilgrim journey with our eyes fixed on heaven and with our hearts longing to be there. We ask it all through Jesus who lives and reigns with you, Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Let's stand and sing Psalm 126 together.
restore us, O oh Lord. Restore us, O oh Lord. Although we are weak, Lord, help us keep going. O oh, seeds of your Psalm 126. Psalm 126, the song of ascents. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. And may God add his richest blessing to the reading. In the hearing of his holy word, let's pray. Father, our only hope is that you would come and be with us now and that you would give us the blessed Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, we've heard Amazing Grace so much. It's kind of a national hymn in that when calamity happens, even the atheist knows they're supposed to put Amazing Grace on, right? College uh, bands that no longer play anything sacred, perhaps, like the University of South Carolina band, after every football game, the last song the Carolina band plays before they leave is Amazing Grace, beautifully. And whoever's left in the stands is perfectly silent. There's something about this hymn that, that captures all of us, okay? And, and partly I think it's because it, it, it brings us from the past grace we've known to the present grace we're living out of to the future grace we're clinging on to with our, with our, with our bare hands that it's true. So, so think about this for a minute. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved, past tense, a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And we're still in the past tense. Was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. 
How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. So, so we're looking back at, at the, the, the moments in our past where we see God's grace show up so clearly in moments of grand deliverance. And then it gets to the present tense. Through many dangers, tolls, and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. And then we transition to, to future grace. When this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Y'all, the story of God's people is that we have been recipients of grace upon grace. And it'll never end. And here's what I want us to see in this psalm tonight. That on this side of heaven, our lives will always be a mixture of what God has done and what he's promised he will still do. We're always in that mixture of promises fulfilled and promises that we're looking and believing by faith will be fulfilled. Under two headings, verses 1 through 3, our salvation must never stop shocking us. And in verses 4 through 6, the promised results of restoration. Here's what one commentator says about this psalm, and I want you to really hear it. Because it shows how it has an immediate context, but also still speaks very much to us as the people of God today. So listen to these words carefully. If, if you need to write, write. If you need to close your eyes to get it, get it. But, but make sure you don't miss this. So the psalm, speaking first to its own time, speaks still. Miracles of the past, it bids us treat as measures of the future. I want you to really get this. Dry places as potential rivers. Hard toil and good seed as the certain prelude to harvest. No doubt this passage has an immediate context. Y'all have been going through it in Ezra and Nehemiah. The people of God were able to return home. And so there's this first moment of great weeping, right? There's this first moment of, uh, we never thought we would be here. Y'all, it's kind of like in a, in a movie or TV show where you've just gotten through this incredible trauma, whether it be a warfare or just one of these catastrophic events in your life. And the first breakdown, the first set of tears is, somehow I made it through. But then you look up and there's a whole other set of tears for all that's been lost and for all that still needs to be found. Is that not what happened in Ezra and Nehemiah? They're back in terms of geographically than the place where they belong. But then they look up and realize we lost it all in exile. We've got to start over. We've lost our worship. We've lost our customs. we lost everything. We've got to start over. And this passage is a depiction of both of those things being true. But in the first place, again, verses 1 through 3, our salvation must never stop shocking us. The last thing I ever want to be is a preacher known for emotional manipulation. I don't ever want to be a trickster who tries different little tongue-in-cheek, different, uh, different gestures. I don't want to be a guy who tries different rhetorical advices to heap up some emotional response in y'all. Because what I want is lasting change. I don't ever want to be somebody who tries to just lead heavy with emotions. And hopefully y'all feel the energy I'm putting off and you give it back. I don't want to ever be that either. But y'all, I have to say that, that what is happening in these first verses is of people who looked up. And truly, they were absolutely shocked that God saved them. And as they looked at the land and as they looked and realized that, oh, Cyrus, he, he wasn't joking. He didn't send us here to kill us halfway back. He, he, he didn't at the end say, ha, ah, surprise, now come back. You know, it, it wasn't one of those things where you dig the ditch out and then at the end of the day you put the dirt back in the ditch. It, it was not one of those things. They really had been set free. God had really visited his people again. He hadn't broken his promises. He was still the covenant-keeping God, keeping God he'd always been for his people. And so, so when they looked up, they were completely undone. It, it says it was like they were dreaming when he restored their fortunes. 
They were pinching themselves going, is this true? Mouths filled with laughter, tongues with shouts of joy. And the nations looked and the nations said, only the God who they always said was true. He had to have been the one behind this because this type of thing doesn't happen. Kings don't say to people who are going to be future enemies, go in peace, we'll fight again one day. They don't do that. And so the nations are looking at this beautiful moment of salvation saying, we cannot, we cannot believe that this really is the character of our God because at this point in exile, there still would have been the few faithful who were slowly handed down. Old wives tells, as it were, of, you know, there was this temple and there was this God we worshipped. And there were these ordinances. There were these things that we did. And now, and now the masses of the Hebrew people were back in the promised land. Back into the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it was such good news. It was such a stirring reality to them. They thought they were dreaming. I don't want to overstate this case, and you're about to understand why I made the statements about emotional manipulation. But people of God, every time we have the privilege of walking back into this church on another Lord's Day, this is supposed to be our response. We're supposed to pinch ourselves and go, is it really true? Do we really just confess our sins and he forgives us? Is it really true that our righteousness is filthy rags, but we've been given the righteousness of Christ? Is it true that no matter what mess I tried to make out of my life this week, when I come to the Lord with a repentant heart, confessing all these things to be true, he forgives me and he loves me and he welcomes me back. Is it true that I take the prodigal, prodigal son's journey day in and day out, but each time I come back, I find him running to me yet again? Is it true? Is it really, really true? And if that's not how you're viewing what we get to do every Lord's Day, then I'm so sorry you haven't understood what corporate worship is. You haven't understood what we've been called to when we're called to this place. I don't expect us to become Pentecostal, right? I don't expect us to become a people who have holy laughter and fall out. But I want some of the coldness that can still be present in our formal services to be knocked out a little bit. Because you can't be people who are filled with laughter and joy and do this. You've got to pick one. And again, I, I don't, we're always going to be a people who are more cerebral. We're always going to be a people who want order and worship. I don't want it, ecstatic utterances in here. I'll make a deacon tell you to leave, right? Like, but just in your own body language... I still think a lot of us are slowly catching up to what this beautiful thing we do every Sunday is. The people of God get to come and remember the good news and look in the scriptures and, and every week just go, it's true again. It, it's really true again. The Spirit showed up again. He blessed the preaching and reading the word again. He was with us in the singing. He was with us in the praying. He was with us in the fellowship. It's true. And, and y'all, I'm telling you this. Yes, the original context were a people who would geographically return. But for the people of God today, when we get back together in corporate worship on the Lord's Day, it really is supposed to be this. I, I, I remember now. I might have forgotten this week, but I remember now. We interviewed um, folks to be new members here before, and some of the testimonies about had me unglued. I wasn't sure if I was going to be coming and preach, to be completely honest with you. And I'm just sitting there going, it's all true. You know, everything we say from this pulpit, your elders, everything we teach from your Sunday school classes, it's all true. And it's a gospel that will change us. It'll make us more like Jesus. It doesn't just save us, but it's, but it's changing us. Because, y'all, that's what we're going to transition to in a minute. But it wasn't enough for them. You, again, if you've been in the Ezra and Nehemiah class, they didn't get to the promised land and go, well, that was nice. I'm glad we're back. No, no, no. They got to work. Because that was what worship made them do. Y'all, you couldn't have kept them off of that wall, right? You couldn't have kept them because they got back in their minds. I, was, I deserved captivity. 
Our sin is what brought us into Cyrus' captivity in the first place. We turned our back on God. We broke covenant with him. He should have left us there. That would have been just for him to do. And y'all, every time we get here, a part of us feels dirty because we're looking at that confession of sin going, are we doing this again? And every week we're hoping, well, maybe next week I'll only need two minutes instead of three. But we need four instead. Are we doing this again? But guess what? As I tell you all this all the time, after the, after the confession of sin will always be the words, the assurance of pardon. Because that's what God has promised he is doing for his people. When you think about your salvation, are you like one who is dreaming? Because you still find it overwhelmingly hard to believe that a sinner such as yourself has received the righteousness of Christ. Sometimes I think we, we still speak too much in the past tense about things. We, we, we say and we pray, Lord, we're undeserving of your grace. And that's a fine comment to make. That's the past. But I hope that what starts to happen in our prayers and in our conversation together is, Lord, we're undeserving of your grace, but wonder of wonders, you have now told us we are deserving of your grace. You have made that declaration over us. That the people of God are deserving of his grace because he has said so. We don't do that part well, do we? Oftentimes our prayer stays back to we're undeserving. But the gospel says, no, 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 he has adopted you. And what is the, the here we go, short of catechism. It says that we have a right, we have a right to all the privileges of the sons. That's what, that's what it means. That's what it is finished, purchased for God's people. And so that we're not deserving is a past tense statement. Can you believe that's true? That in the present, the people of God, not being heretical, not being, uh, not being people with great hubris, can say, because of the righteousness of Christ that's been given to me, because of what he has done in my heart and what he has promised to do, the Father has said, you are now deserving of everything that belongs to the Son. You will be co-heirs with him. Yeah. Is this a dream or is it really true? May we never stop asking that question. Ever. May the gospel never get dull to us to the point that we stop wondering, is this a dream? This passage isn't more complicated than that. It really isn't. But secondly, we see the promised results of restoration. Because here we go, right? We're back in the hymn Amazing Grace. The story is we do come in here and we, we dream and go, can it be really true? And then we pause and go, oh, Lord, how can it be that I still struggle with sin so much? How can it be that the old man still has so much sway over me? How can it be? By the way, follow me here. I'm not trying to be irreverent, but I really think y'all can follow me here. Satan, if Mike Leach is the air raid guy, Satan, Satan's the same way. He runs the same five plays on me. He always has. Satan has never had to get tricky with me. It's the same exact trap every single time, and somehow I fall into it. Do y'all feel that way? He, he doesn't have to be that sneaky. He really doesn't. He just puts the same carrot out there, and we go, oh, there's a carrot. <laughs> so that's why they got a bag of seed, and they're crying. They're crying so hard they can't stop sowing, or they can't start sowing. Because they're, they're going, Lord, we're back. Let me, let me use my language. If, if verses 1 through 3 are justification. Verses 4 through 6 are sanctification. <laughs> right? They, they realize what they've been given categorically, judicially, covenantally in verses 1 through 3. But then they stop and go, if all that's true, we got a field to plant. If all that's true, we've got this beautiful harvest awaiting us because God is going to do what he said he would do. And, and what that means is, he's, he, not only did he bring us back here, he's, he's going to redeem our children and our children's children and our children's 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 children. They, they start counting in big numbers in the, in the Old Testament, don't they? 
That his faithfulness would be to the nth generation, right? But they knew that until Jesus comes back or brings us to himself, that the journey of sanctification in the life of a believer has to be lived with a future promised result in mind. A lot of agronomists or farmers in this church are at least somewhere close to our families, right? You put that seed in the ground and farmers I know wouldn't dare cross their fingers. They're, that would be beneath them, but you know what I mean. You put that seed in the ground and you're going, is it going to come up? Okay, it came up. Is it going to grow? Okay. All right, it's up, ready to pick. Can we pick it? And from beginning to end until that combine has put it in house and frankly it's sold the whole time. It's, y'all, it's this, if you haven't farmed or been around farmers, they're all crazy. And the reason why is because for seven months out of the year they're going, I'm either going to lose everything or I'm going to be rich. Maybe somewhere between the two. And notice right now the farmers aren't, ain't smiling a bit. But it's true. Y'all, the difference is we plant a field with the certainty that it's going to produce a good crop. Think about that. Nowhere else in life is it true. Nowhere else in life can we say, I promise you, you do the right things. Do A, B, and C, and this will be the result. Oh, we wish that was the case, but it's only sometimes the case. But the Lord has promised his people, I can guarantee you this. I'm going to transform a people. I'm going to make them like Jesus. They're going to be holy as I am holy because I'm going to work holiness in them. The Spirit's going to be at work and they're going to be at work and this beautiful synergy is going to happen. And they're going to change. And the world's going to take notice. And again, we read forward in the story and all of a sudden, not only, not only did they sow their field, but at some point in time, the Gentiles are going to be grafted in. And all of a sudden, you look up, and what's being prayed for and wept about in the second half of this psalm in the fullness of time has happened. And one day, every tribe, tongue, nation, and people group is going to come and bow the knee before the Father. And at some point in that chronology, there were a group of people who had just been freed from Cyrus who were looking up going, will we ever plant and, sow and harvest a field again? Y'all never read this simply as history. Read this as God's history. Never forget that our presence in this room tonight is an ironclad argument that everything he said in the Bible is true. Thought about that? The fact that he's still saving the people, do we need a stronger apologetic than that? Well, how do you know God is real? Because he saved me. Frankly, if that's not good enough for most people, most of the time, nothing will do. I'm not against intellectual arguments. I learned them all in seminary, too. I'm just telling you like it is, 80% of the time, they're going to fall on deaf ears. But what people will notice is, I can tell you what's true. Here's what the Lord said he's going to do to his people, for his people, in his people. And he's been doing it for thousands of years. Think about how strong that is, y'all. But this life is a lot of weeping until we wait for joy, right? Heaven's mourn isn't here yet. We haven't crossed the Jordan yet. We're going to sing after this. We're still on this side of Jordan's stormy banks. And he gives us his presence for relief. And yet again, y'all, here is why they kept putting one foot in front of the other and, camp, and kept putting seeds in the ground. Because they knew that even a place as dry and desolate as the Negev, when the Lord sent them rain, it flooded like a river. And it was almost like these people understood. And all the foreign deities got it wrong. But the, the Hebrew people understood the fact that we grow a crop in a place where there's no moisture. There has to be a God who's done this for his people. And then you apply that spiritually speaking. And I hope y'all realize that him saving us is against all odds. Y'all, there's no earthly explanation. I'm going to make sure you hear me in case you don't think I'm talking about you. There's no earthly explanation for our salvation. 
We all love our sin entirely too much. Unless he has told us the truth in Scripture. Unless that assurance of pardon from this morning is true that he replaces our hearts of stone with the hearts of flesh. And that he gives us the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's why the crop comes out of the ground and why it reaches harvest. Because he's the Lord of history. Because his desire is to have worshipers from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people group present in heaven. And because he's not going to stop and he will tarry until that's accomplished. And it's a guarantee. So what do we do? What do we do? The people of God are dreamers, we're laughers, we're shouters, we're weepers, we're sowers, we're harvesters. And, 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 and in all of these things, we're people whose eyes are fixed on God. The God who has loved his own in such a profound way that, that he always brings us back home. And y'all, it might be, it might be the reason why you haven't walked in here as if you're dreaming on, on, on Sunday mornings is because you still feel like there's such distance between you and the Lord. Let me plead with you, come back home. He hasn't put the distance there. You have. Let me plead with you. I know you think it's scary. What if I actually mortify this sin? What if I'm truthful about this sin? What's going to happen? I can assure you, anything that comes from repentance is a better option than harboring sin. Any side effects that come from repentance is a far more redemptive, peace-providing, life-giving option than to let live what's supposed to be killed. And then let's come back to the Lord. Y'all, don't complicate what's simple. What we do here every day in our lives, but certainly what we do here on the Lord's Day really does have a divine simplicity to it. We take our sin seriously. We take our Savior seriously. We believe that his grace is greater than all of our sin. And we desire that out of that truth we would be worshipers. That we would be kingdom minded, great commission minded worshipers. Whose lives are affected and the lives of everybody around us are affected. Because we have confessed and professed that these things are true. I'm going to tell you all what I tell you often. My simple prayer for me and for my wife and for my children and for all of you is that we never, ever have to get sent to live with Cyrus to become as those who dream. That we never, ever are given over. That it wouldn't take hard hearts to remember the beauty of a soft one. But that the Lord, through the means of grace and through the fellowship we have for one another and with one another, that he would keep us so tender and so malleable to his spirit's leading that we never go far from home. That before we left the property, before we got anywhere near the pig slop, we would stop and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. My father who loves me is right behind me. I just, I just have to turn around and go back home. And every time we walk back in this place, would there be a moment, perhaps when we get to the back door, perhaps when we sit down with the bulletin in our hand, would there be just that slight moment of reflection where we say it's all true and my mouth is filled with joy and my tongue with shouts of laughter because that's what good news is supposed to do for us. It's supposed to change us. It's supposed to make us worshipers. And may it be May it be that you and I, who are limping, who are barely dragging in here on Sunday morning spiritually, and then sometimes literally, but spiritually speaking, would we know that what's always going to happen, what's always going to happen when we come here, is that he'll restore us yet again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father, if they're just my words, they'll be gone before we leave. But if they're your words, they'll change us. And so would that be the case? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together the song of thanksgiving. So we
the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing the doxology. Praise God from